Welcome to the healthcare workshop this afternoon. Um, I think it's one of the, the hot topics really in relation to, to AI. Um, and uh, I'm really delighted to have three fantastic speakers. I'd consider them, consider them world leading speakers actually on, on this topic. Um, and um, I'd like to um, uh, hand over to them to, to introduce themselves and to give some background and some thoughts on, on AI and healthcare. So over to you, Dan. Thanks, Peter, and um, thanks for inviting me to be here. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm, I'm Dan Bamford. I'm the Deputy Director for the AI and Health and Social Care Award, which is a, a joint initiative between NHS England's Accelerated Access Collaborative and NHSX's AI Lab. And it's, um, it's a £140 million grant pot that's being used as part of a broader range of measures to support the, um, the, the adoption of AI technologies across health and social care uh, and also achieve a broader uh, a broader sort of uh, macro objective of making the UK a really uh, kind of world leading attractive hub for developers, academics, evaluators to come and further um, AI technologies with the important benefit that NHS patients will get uh, quicker access to those technologies as they, uh, as they come off the, um, or come through the pipeline. So we're, we're sort of really excited by the, the potential transformative effects of, of AI over the next few years. And I think this is going to be a, a period where we move from a lot of excitement and hype through to kind of real world evidence generation, delivery and scaling of, of AI technologies. And that's really the, the kind of big ambition behind the, the grant pool that I run and the, and the wider work of the AI lab. Uh, in terms of background on me, uh, prior to coming into this role about a year ago to, um, to run the, the AI award, I sort of started life out as a, a management consultant, spent some time in, um, in health insurance strategy consulting, uh, and then came to NHS improvement as it was then, there been a whole host of mergers, um, about seven years ago. And since then have uh, done a lot of improvement and transformation roles. Uh, and during my time, I've also spent uh, a considerable amount of time working operationally in management roles in secondary care. So I'm, I'm sort of really excited by the, by the potential for these technologies and kind of really interested in the, the kind of technical adoption uh, issues around bringing them into pathways in primary and secondary care. And great to be with you today. Brilliant. Thanks, Dan. Great, great summary of your background. Um, who would like to go next? Mark, would you like to... Explain your background. Hi everybody, delighted to be here. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me along. Uh, Mark Lomax, uh, trained as a doctor once upon a time, but I spent the last 20 or so years of my career in the entrepreneurial space, uh, spe specifically within healthcare. Um, my first big venture was all around hospital at home services, which uh, was revolutionary at its time, but uh, is now almost ubiquitous ubiquitous across uh, NHS centres with everyone having a hospital at home service in place which is fantastic. I've been the CEO of PEP Health now for about a year and a half and um, PEP Health is, uh, PEP stands for the patient experience platform and we collate, categorise and score real world patient experience data from a range of different sources, predominantly social media and online review platforms and we collect in the order of about a million comments a month um, across the whole of the UK. And with that, we're able to build up a picture of insights about what patients really think about their care. And uh, so the, what really looking forward to the discussion this afternoon and um, happy to share some of our insights as well as some of our wider thoughts on, uh, on what, we, what, we, what we're doing. Great. Thanks, Mark. It's great. Great summary once again. Ma Maxine, over to you. Hello, uh, yeah, lovely to be here um, and lovely to be on such a, an ebullient panel. Uh, so my name is Maxine McIntosh. I'm a research fellow uh, working between the Health Foundation, which is the UK's, uh, one of the UK's largest health research charities, the Alan Turing Institute, which is the UK's National Institute for AI and Data Science, and the University of Oxford's Computational Statistics and Machine Learning Group. Um, so most of my work looks at applying uh, machine learning to NHS data, although certainly for the last year, it's mostly been just like forcing new collaborations and new people to work together in a way that maybe a pandemic had meant we decided that it would be easier not to work together. Um, but, uh, and that so far has involved largely looking at how we can use consumer data, so data from 
our, our very mundane at the moment daily lives from our transactions, where we move, where we eat, what we do, who we interact with um, from the large consumer data companies and how we can use those data to enrich our understanding of, of our health and, and well-being. So how we can augment electronic health records. So that's my day job. And then in my kind of evenings and weekends and lunch times and I need to get a life, um, I run an organisation called One Health Tech, which is a distributed grassroots community that supports better diversity and inclusion in health tech. Um, so we've got about 14,000 members across about 20 hubs globally, um, run by an incredible community of about 150 volunteers. And we do everything from running events to training programs, to mentorship scheme, to just like having a nice community to, to be a launch pad for whatever you need to do next. Um, and so that provides me a lot of the, the non-technical joy and, and the I think for me, the cause I really care about, which is around um, particularly on health inequalities and diversity and inclusion. Thank you, Maxine. F fantastic summary again. Um, so dive, let's try, dive straight into some, some questions, I think, about um, AI and healthcare. So I think probably the first one is, is, is really pertinent and um, obviously highly relevant to our current situation. But given the inequality challenges being surfaced from COVID, um, how can AI be used to improve health inequalities moving forward, do you think? I kick off <laughs> given the fact I just teen myself up for at the end. <laughs> um, so, so I think there's there's direct and indirect. I mean, I'm sure um, uh, Mark and Dan will frame it slightly differently, but I think there's direct and indirect ways that AI has an impact. So um, I think looking at the ethnic inequalities and disparity in outcomes, we saw much different ethnic groups in COVID is a really good use case. So um, AI is very useful to statistically help us understand what's going on. So um, is it that simply the color of your skin meant you had worse outcomes. And that's a quite an important question to be able to understand because then we've got a question of, is there something physiologically or ge genetically going on? Or is it because we live in an institutionally racist society and black and ethnic minorities have by and large um, lower socioeconomic status, come from more deprived areas, work in uh, industries which expose themselves more to COVID risk. And disentangling all of those things is a really, really difficult statistical problem to, to work on. And um, lo and behold, newsflash, we live in an institutionally racist uh, world, and that's mostly why um, uh, different ethnic minorities have worse outcomes. But there are lots of nuances to unpick, and, and we weren't able to answer that question very well uh, until some quite important cause analyses started coming out. Um, there's lots of other ways that AI can be applied to kind of look at model for, for inequalities, to look at models, to, to test, statistically explore um, the understanding and the causal mechanisms on, under why different groups have different types of outcomes and to disentangle that. So there's like an example of a direct way that AI can be used, but there's indirect ways. You know, AI has got loads of funding at the moment. You know, everything in their dog is AI. And that's been a really, really helpful uh, catalyst and mechanism by which to draw attention to a few things that do have an effect on health inequalities. So for example, um, given the huge swathes of AI funding that are going into um, training, uh, there's a new uh, initiative called Conversion Courses, which takes people who are mid-career um, and often from uh, uh, non-scientific backgrounds and retrains them to be uh, AI researchers, which is wonderful because it by and large is picking up women, people with caring responsibilities, people who previously might have not have been working in AI. And we know that by and large, when problems are worked on by populations that for whom a problem really matters to them. So these are you know, traditionally underserved things. So it could be women's health, it could be ethnic minority health, it could be certainly patient groups, which Mark will, will comment on. We know that those, those questions get answered better. So there's a kind of secondary benefit, which is that the hype and interest around AI means that there's so much more attention being given to diversifying the questions being asked and the people answering those questions. Yeah, it's it's a great question. And there's so many different ways in which we could sort of uh, take it forward as well. Would agree everything that you've just said there, Maxine, completely. A couple of other things that sort of are on our minds more on a day-to-day -day basis, thinking of it from uh, what patients actually say, is first of all, hearing them. And quite often with patient engagement strategies and traditional survey techniques, quite often captures either the same groups of people time and time again, or online review platforms especially, they can really either attract the really delighted or the really unhappy patients. But what about that middle ground or the people that are maybe with disabilities or ethnic minorities who aren't really using the, um, the traditional routes that the institutions would like them to do. And so 
that's why we we really find a huge amount of value from the social media data because it's where these groups are more likely to be and it's where they comment and it's also very easy for them to to comment and so for us to collect their public comments that they post out there gives us a real ability to start analyzing that insight and for us, it's really still a learning journey. There's some things we do know, but there's a lot that we still don't know, which is equally quite exciting with the, the size of the, um, the data set that we've got. But for instance, somewhere like down in the Southwest Peninsula, say Cornwall, which is one of the socioeconomically, one of the more deprived parts of the country overall, they've actually got the highest patient experience of uh, nearly any region in the country, which would be so slightly counterintuitive to what you'd anticipate. And they've also got less choice, which is also sort of quite quite interesting as well. So some of these things don't necessarily go hand in glove. We're also sort of going through this period of COVID where sort of who's, who's sort of such a dynamic world, both for families, individuals, but also for the healthcare systems. So trying to actually keep a track of that and seeing what's going up and what's going down, it's probably never been a more useful time to really have that ability to track these things in real time. We, um, we, we had a, a piece of uh, work published by the HSJ earlier this week, and it was really about the, the speed of access to services. And certainly there's been this massive difference between lockdown one and the more recent lockdown we've had in terms of patient experience. First time, there was actually a surge of appreciation for, for patient sentiment overall, patient satisfaction partly down to maybe NHS appreciation, but also when we did a deeper dive, it was the things around people's anxieties being sort of, sort of, sort of their concerns were, they realized they didn't need to worry about and the hospitals were very well set up. And also hospitals were really, really quite quiet relatively back then. So they rattled through the, the services much quicker than anticipated, A&E departments were quiet, so on and so forth. And now I think there's this backlog of people waiting for care, Issues that might have been a grumble nine months ago might be more painful, might be more of a disability for them, more, more anxiety inducing, maybe, maybe even sort of more serious than that as well. And so there's this pent up demand, which I suppose is now sort of modifying everyone's outlook on services. And so it's going to mean a, a really dynamic period of service change as services try to catch up. And we're, we're looking at sort of what, what, what are the most important things for patients? and clearly not being able to do all of it at the same time. So, I mean, there's, there's so many different ways that we sort of really need to drill into this. It's, um, it's, it's sort of, um, we almost feel like we're sort of, sort of kids in a sweet shop, that there's, there's so many different questions to answer. It's almost sort of trying to sort of work out which are the most important questions to start with and where equally do people want us to start through that, through that analysis and sort of pulling out the, the really rich insights that will transform services and, and help patients ultimately. Thanks, Mark. Dan, do you want to contribute to that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so sort of three things that I'd like to talk about here. First is around the, the kind of the topic of access that Mark Mark mentioned. The, the second was about some of the the risks and biases that, that Maxine talked to, and then the, the third was about uh, what what we're doing through the AI award to try and ensure um, uh, AI machine learning solutions land safely in the in the NHS. So I kind of run through those. First on the point of access, I think. Um, I think there's a really exciting opportunity for AI to make a hugely positive contribution to leveling up and addressing health inequalities. And a couple of kind of key mechanisms for me are, you know, one, we, have, we face a whole host of, of workforce challenges where access to um, scarce skills leads to variability in, um, in, in advice quality available in different, um, different hospitals or different um, primary care centres. To kind of give you know, to give a couple of examples, uh, or to give one example, we have a, a breast screening program. It's a national program across the country that involves um, uh, the breast scan being read by two human readers, and and depending on whether or not they agree, uh, that determines what happens to the patient in terms of recall for further investigation. In some hospitals in the country, you'd have um, two consultant radiologists reading that. In some, you might have um, one radiologist, one radiographer, or two radiographers. And so actually, there's already inbuilt into our system, because of workforce challenges, 
uh, an inequality of, um, of service in effect. And AI by providing um, augmentation and, and decision support tools to the clinicians ultimately making the decision can help address some of that, um, that inequality that comes from sc uh, scarcity in, in skills and challenges that different hospitals face around attracting different types of skill mixes. And the second area I think it's kind of really exciting around access is increasingly as services become networked and there are more and more models where there are um, specialist centres acting as hubs and um, kind of referring centres acting as spokes where concentration of expertise is, is held in the hub. Uh, AI technologies can really support getting patients as quickly as possible to the right centre, which has the relevant level of expertise. And to take that kind of bit, that abstract concept a bit, bit more real, one of the technologies we've supported so far um, in, the, in the AI award is a technology that helps triage um, patients with suspected stroke and will do a, a CT of their brain and will then inform decisions about, A, whether they need to get... Um, uh, uh, a medical intervention, an intravenous drug that help a treatment and whether they're eligible for that. And then crucially, whether they are eligible for a, a service called mechani mechanical thrombectomy, which involves um, the basically the breaking up of, of a clot. And that happens only in specialist centres. So you need to understand really quickly who's eligible for that. And AI at the referring centres can do that more quickly than... Um, than through kind of human intervention alone, where there may not be the, the level of sort of case expertise or case throughput for people to recognise that, um, that use case as quickly as possible. So AI could be a bit of a leveller, in my view. Um, secondly, we are we're supporting AI technologies to evaluate their, um, their solutions in, in real world settings through the AI award. So we've made um, 10, 10 grants to what we call phase four technologies. Uh, these are the most mature ones who are um, being funded by us to do research across multiple sites. The reason we're asking them to do multiple site studies is to test the idea of generalizability of their solution across different populations and across different health settings. And the purpose of that is to make sure that the AI we roll out on the NHS um, raises all boats and doesn't just go to um, centres that serve a particular demographic or, um, or centres that are already kind of experts in, um, in digital tech and leads to a bit of a widening of the gap between the haves and the have-nots. Uh, and then just lastly, very quickly, uh, Max team talked to some of the risks around um, kind of AI deployment in relation to health inequalities. This is something that the AI lab uh, is really concerned about. There's a really exciting research program kicking off in conjunction with the Ada Lovelace Institute around um, potential for algorithmic bias and the ethical implications of that. Um, so a super important area and one that um, we hope to make a meaningful um, contribution to. Great, thanks Diane. Um, really fascinating topic. I think we could speak all day about that. But um, I think uh, just leading into the next question, um, and, and inevitably there's going to be a bit of bit of a pandemic focus to to, to this conversation. But um, do you think we can use AI to predict failures on a, a national healthcare scale? Uh, can we use AI models to run scenarios, identify weaknesses in pandemic planning before they happen? Do you think this is something that we're heading towards, or? or are we already there, but it's just not showing through in the way that we want it to? Shall I? I'll go, I'll go first on this one. Um, the, there's a few examples of what we know now or sort of what, where we can help and sort of where this might go to in the future. Um, we had a paper published nearly a couple of years ago, which was the, the foundation stone for our technology, which showed that we could predict CQC ratings, which is the, the, the UK regulator for those that don't know the CQC and how they would um, rate uh, an NHS trust. Um, sort of we, we could predict that before it actually happens. And so whilst it's not 
a failure to be um, sort of uh, sort of depending on sort of your your view on the CQC ratings. Uh, it does give a proxy of being able to sort of get an, an early barometer at least, and uh, an earlier barometer than a maybe an, an intermittent episode as to what's really happening. What we've also done in more real time is we're seeing that sort of across services more widely, there's some really dynamic behaviours happening out there during the, the COVID episode. And the one that perhaps I'd use as an example of actually maternity services, where before COVID, there was a number of cases where certain, certain locations were um, sort of getting interventions, they were in the press for all the wrong reasons, and so concern about what was actually happening there. We actually went back and retrospectively looked at could we have predicted that at the time? And did we know that, but we just hadn't looked in the database? And actually our worst performing maternity units that were coming out with our algorithms were all the ones that were in the press for all the wrong reasons. So there's, there's certainly sort of something there where I think we can certainly start to start rolling this forward and start thinking of, of that predictive behavior. I think the other thing for us that's a really interesting question that sits alongside predictive failure is, if we can do it, what do we actually do with it as a sort of as, as an SME that's sort of sort of still still in startup mode for, for, for all intents and purposes? And who do we share this information with in a responsible manner? And if we know somebody's failing, what what do we do with it and who, who should we go there? Um, just as, a, as an example, because it's maybe quite a fascinating insight on terms of psychology and behaviours and some of the challenges we've got for wider adoption is that I wrote to every NHS chief executive around about Christmas time with how they were performing uh, for their maternity service against uh, the, the national uh, averages and uh, what, what quartile they were sitting in and were they going up or down and got a really good response from a lot of them. But also the ones that reached out and said, we want to find out more, tell us how this all works, what can we learn from it, were all the high performing maternity units. And they were the ones that wanted to get better and improve. And so there's this slight mismatch in terms of those that are really embracing these kind of insights are the ones that are flying anyway. And if we're not careful, the gap between the struggling and the, the best is, is going to grow. And that, that variation in care is going to grow and widen when we look at these different different areas. And so I think AI definitely has a role to play, but it's when it sort of comes into the real world and really practical, messy challenges that probably those chief executives that have got those problems, have got a million and one other problems on their to-do list that is noise in their head, time that's been taken up in their daytime. And that's, that's the real challenge that um, is, um, I think AI has got a fabulous role to play, but it's, um, it's how that can sort of just get over that real world problem that uh, is nobody's fault, but I can just sort of sense the, the tangible pain that's probably on the other side of, uh, of the desk for them. Thanks, Mark. Does anybody else, anything else to contribute there? Well, I, um, <laughs> after you, Maxine. Right, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in because I'm off mute. Um, so I think there's, um, you know, there's a, there's a kind of clear story which has been um, uh, illuminated through COVID of, of you know, big data coming to bear in, in healthcare um, as it has in other industries and you know, healthcare is maybe in, in the sort of uh, a following wave. But there's, uh, in the time that I've been working within NHS England and improvement, there's been just a kind of uh, an exponential growth in the access to data health centrally and how that's used to inform, um, in, in my case, regulation when I was in the regulatory arm of um, NHS EI, but more broadly operational planning across the organisation. I think through, through COVID, we've actually taken a significant step forward in how we use the data that we are um, collecting and using it much more intelligently and there's there's been a big program called the um, NHS COVID data store um, which has uh, you know, has had some some controversy about it for um, for uh, some different factors but one of um, you know one of the kind of real lessons from the development of the COVID data store is actually we are able to join up uh, the healthcare data sets we have in, in the NHS much more effectively than we have to date. There's a huge amount of really rich data that's even more powerful when put together. 
And then we can actually use that to drive really important decisions like um, allocation of PPE when we've had a PPE crisis and there's some really tough decisions about where does scarce floors go, uh, mapping of ventilators to understand um, where nationally all our ventilated patients are, um, what does that mean for management of acute beds across the, the sector as a whole, and a host of other and a host of other factors, including vac vaccination rollout planning. So, you know, despite despite you know um, a, a number of issues around this topic, there's a huge there's a huge opportunity for harnessing the the powerful data that the NHS undoubtedly holds. In addition to what's going on, sort of nationally, which can be you know can be the data that can be used to harness um, uh, harness for kind of screening of new population level threats. There's also some really exciting work going on in the AI lab around um, curating and providing access to data sets at scale for AI developers. The first area where this has happened is in the uh, national COVID imaging data set. So respiratory scans that um, NHSX have basically set up a service that aggregates them across, I think it's something like um, 50 different contributing sites. And that becomes a data set that AI developers can use to develop algorithms, but also have, potentially have them externally validated. And this will allow AI to make, um, you know, make an impact on the treatment and recovery from COVID, but could also potentially be extended to spotting early the next respiratory threat that will turn up um, when we look at respiratory images at scale. So, um, you know, probably one, um, one pretty sort of generic reflection that there's a lot of data in the NHS and we're getting better at um, using it. Uh, and then maybe a more concrete one about a you know, specific example within the COVID environment of how we've um, started to kind of create a, uh, you know, a, a data leg or a data store that's going to help developers bring innovations to the benefits of patients more quickly. And, and I imagine that will be the start of more of the same over the, over the coming years. Add a tiny little bit to the data store. Um, so I was I was going to talk, talk about the data store. So Dan has covered it much better than I would. But I guess there's probably just two things to add on to that um, in response to, to your question, Peter, which is that uh, there's a thing called the COPE notice, which um, I, I don't know anyone who um, has a before and after the COPE notice, but it's had a profound transformative cultural effect on people's willingness to to share data. So the COPE notice basically um, not only supported, but basically mandated for uh, data to be shared for the use of response to COVID, um, which meant that overnight um, data controllers and providers didn't have an excuse as to why it was too complicated to share data, which is basically for anyone who's been working in the health and AI space has plagued our day-to-day -day for years, if not decades. Um, and that has just been transformative because people now really understand why data should be shared, why data, why combining data is really, really valuable. And be that a local or a sort of national data store level, um, I think that for me is a really important takeaway from what, uh, what, what COVID has encouraged the whole ecosystem to do. And the second thing is that, you know, lots of the examples that Dan gave are like really boring hospital and health system administrative type questions that are really, really important, but the, the risk threshold for both access to, to that, those data and what happens if you get it like slightly wrong is nowhere near as risky as the effect of giving an incorrect diagnosis to an individual in an emergency setting. And I think that to put more emphasis on those sorts of data sets where you are looking at non-patient data, so, um, you know, sit reps all around me, um, or how, how many ventilators do you have in what region? Like those are really, really important data sets to start with, because actually um, we've got lots of, uh, we've got lots of me mechanistic problems we need to sort out in terms of building models. Um, and that would be a lot better to be done on, on non-sensitive data than it, would be do when then, than it would be to start with very, very sensitive, high risk patient data. Brilliant, thanks, thanks Maxime. Um, Really, again, a really interesting conversation, which I think we could go on for, for some time. But um, I think just moving on, um, I think a really interesting topic, which I think um, relates to a lot of, the, of healthcare professionals right now, and also students that are coming through the system and qualifying, is uh, what the impact of AI diagnostics will be um, now in the future on, um, on uh, healthcare professional workflows.
Shall I, shall I jump in on that one? Go for it, Dan. <laughs> um, so again, a, a super, super interesting question. And, you know, one that's been very much on the minds of the, you know, the national health bodies uh, for a while, but particularly since the, the topple review in 2019, which sort of outlined um, you know, the required skills for the next generation of clinicians and, and some of the skills gap that, that currently exist. Um, really exciting to hear Maxine talk about that, like the, the, um, the, the transition process um, that she described into um, into data science. Maybe we need something analogous for, for healthcare. What, um, what, what I see kind of as a starting point is we see, we see AI as, as transforming and enhancing clinical careers rather than you know, threatening jobs and replacing clinicians. Broadly, what we want to do is use AI to do the to do the tasks that don't require um, don't require a human and free up the humans to do the tasks that only they can do around caring. And when you look at how pressurized our workforce is, and you look at what the coming um, you know, the coming kind of workforce gaps are going to be across a range of specialties, I think anything we can do to take um, to take out more of the um, the mechanical or even administrative tasks from a clinician's workflow is actually something to be really welcomed. Uh, that, having said that though, you, you need to demonstrate, innovators need to demonstrate to the clinicians who will be working with their technology. And actually it's not just clinicians, but clinicians and, and operational managers and other, um, other healthcare professionals involved in the workflow, how the technology will impact uh, the pathway into which it's being um, adopted. And so thinking more broadly, not just about a technology solving a particular um, specific problem around um, prognostication or triaging or whatever it is, but actually thinking what happens to the patient across the whole pathway of treatment and what does the impact of AI have downstream and what are all the interactions um, that humans will have with the AI and how will it change human behavior or, or their um, you know, risk appetite to decision-making? So all of those questions are, are super important and we're encouraging innovators to explore them as part of their real world data generation. And it's going to be a, a sort of really important theme that our colleagues are, are nice um, and public health England who are going to play an important role in rolling these technologies out will be will be concerned about um, and then sort of lastly uh, we work closely with with health education England who are who are, who are gearing up to think about what are the the educational offers and training program um, evolutions that will need to take place to prepare clinicians for um, the next set of digital tools that we'll, they'll be using, and I think it's going to be really exciting to see where um, where that goes. And um, I think it's going to be a, a space that develops really quickly. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Mark, uh, let's jump in yeah, there. I totally agree with everything Dan said. It's um, I, I suspect, although sort of I've never heard it formally said that we could never recruit enough healthcare workers to meet the demands of the whole population and the, the demographics as it evolves and changes and all these new treatments and sort of everything else that sort of com comes online. So it shouldn't be seen as a, a threat to, to, to healthcare workers, the, the advent of AI, but a, an augmentation and a help and hopefully taking away those mundane tasks so they can actually spend more of their time doing the things that they really want to be doing as part of their roles. Um, and I, I think that the piece of work that uh, NHSX did around uh, the ethical use of AI, I think is sort of absolutely to that point of building that trust. And it's only when services or solutions are trusted that they're gonna get that adoption and people will be willing to let go of task A or task B or whatever whatever it is that's in their, in their, in their thing. Because safety, obviously paramount importance, but then there's links to reliability and, links to sort of the the usefulness of it all and the, and the usability of it all because it's um that that design interface has to work so that it, it works on the ground for the people who actually have to do something with it and without that 
it, it won't get that traction that it needs for adoption. Thanks, Mark. Maxine, did you have anything to, to contribute there? No, because there are so many good questions coming into the Q and A. <laughs> I want to, I want to remove myself to make sure we've got time to, to no answer. Well, I was going to say I had a, a, a nice uh, pre-prepared question about bias, which we've covered in lots of other sessions. So I'm going to jump that and go for the fastball straight straight to the fastball questions that have been given to us by the audience. So I think there's a there's a really nice one here, which I think. Um, does sort of chime with me in terms of my experiences is, is in relation to data silos. Um, and um, there are areas where data uh, is, is availability is limited. Um, and uh, you obviously have, can get the siloing. How do, we, how do we bring data together so we can make better decisions and, and enable AIs to make better decisions? It might be a big one for you, Dan, that one. High oh, pressure. <laughs> um, so I think there's um, so th there's potentially something we can do nationally and I, I sort of mentioned the national COVID imaging database as, as one example of where we're trying to curate data sets nationally there may be other areas in which you know in which that could happen which will allow for the you know the, the walls to be removed and the silos to be dismantled I think that we also need to encourage more, more local solutions that don't require um, either a kind of major program from um, NHS ERI or, or some, some really sort of draconian guidance, albeit, um, you know, albeit sort of like copy style measures can be very helpful. We should also be looking to think about how can we shape the environment to enable um, better sh data sharing among partners where that can be done you know, appropriately in, in line with um, data protection regulations for the purposes of um, creating data sets that can be used to um, train and test algorithms. So then one area we're, we're interested in sort of thinking about how we can um, apply AI is, is social care. The award I run is the AI and Health and Social Care Award. But at the moment, one of the, one of the barriers face there is the you know the availability of large scale data sets to to train technologies on and um i don't i don't have the answers but part part of the solution must be understanding what the barriers are to local data controllers being able to share that for the benefit of developing services that benefit patients thanks well yeah i was, I was going to also um mention social care i think it's obviously what happened with in-care homes is atrocious. I also think it's been a really, really helpful magnifying glass to expose the fact that we had so little data on what was happening in social care that we had no idea the degree to which infections were rising in care homes. So I think this, this has been a kind of helpful wake up call for, for people who didn't realize the degree of data infrastructure or lack of availability in social care. Um, there, there's obviously a, a whole host of reasons why we have data silos, but the thing that is, is very pertinent in social care but I think it's very pertinent for AI because of how um, inherently almost commercial it is is that uh, in social care we have data silos because providers are, are basically almost exclusively private providers and they have very little incentive and very little requirement to actually share data um, between the different providers and we've we've seen that with electronic health vendors in primary care and secondary care we spent years and decades putting in interoperability standards to allow data to flow between different private vendors. Um, and I think social care is just such a good example. We've got very, very fragmented provision that's also not state provided. Um, and the moment you have that, it just adds this extra layer of complexity to accessing data and to bring it together. So um, I think that the privatization of where data is held is a massive problem. And I think that as really innovative companies, that collect really, really valuable data about patients and about the system, you know, there's a really difficult thing to, to balance up there about how do you ensure that you are a viable small or big company that can you know, build your models and provide a great service, but also work appropriately with and in combination with the health system. Obviously, Mark can talk about this quite extensively and it sounds like Mark's doing a wonderful job of, of embedding and also you're making sure that he's alive as a, as a startup. Um, but I think there's so many examples of, of companies that do a really, really inappropriate and unethical job. Um, and I think AI has really just exposed that. And so I really am worried about the current data silos but also the, all the new ones are emerging as a result of this right, very thriving AI ecosystem. But I can see that on the horizon being a bit of a problem. 
the um, just one other thought I had that just sort of a slightly different uh, angle to it is it's not really mentioned so much now, but there was a real trend for value based healthcare some years ago. And the, I think the, the logic behind it still stands with sort of value based healthcare being this combination of outcomes times experience divided by the cost of the care itself. And you can imagine each of those three is a different data silo. And actually, if we could actually and it, it never, I don't think it ever went anywhere because it was just too difficult to do ultimately. But if we could crack that, bringing those three different data silos together, you get a really richness of colour of how that would look. Uh, and I don't know what the answer is to Maxine's sort of challenge that she gave to the social care, but uh, I suspect there'd have to be something about the, commin the commissioners of that service, which is not so easy if it's private pay again, but if it was sort of uh, publicly funded social care to, to sort of be a way of driving uh, the data sets to sort of be able to give it. But uh, it'd be a nice one to sort of pull that together. It would be uh, transformative, I suspect, to the social care sector. Brilliant. Um, again, another really interesting topic. I'm just taking another question here. I think um, uh, someone's questioned whether um, smart personal healthcare devices, such as watches, can be used to predict illness. I mean, is, that, is this something that we're going to see a lot more of in the future? I mean, there's already a lot of technology around this, but, but do you think that it's going to really pervade throughout the healthcare system where we, we're actually sort of self-caring more and self analyzing ourselves using these devices and understanding the triggers and, and information from these devices that's coming through. Yeah, I think um, I'll come in on that. Absolutely. There's, uh, I, take, I, I think of, of health data in four categories. So there's, there's data that we inherently think of as, as health care data, which is things like genetics and electronic health records and things that we kind of like know is very, very medical. And I would say that there's then um, health Kind of consumer health data which i think is what the question was referring to so the fact that i'm wearing a fitbit and that the person asking questions noticed some changes in their readings before they got the flu um and you know that those will inherently become more accessible and more widespread as the cost gets driven down and the accuracy of those readings improve so uh, at the moment it's it, it's interesting but more more gimmicky than of clinical interest at the moment for the for the large for, for i think for the broader population i think some people will have absolutely had really really valuable and important experiences with say wearable devices then the other kind of two categories are big demographic information like census type data which is around people's largely social determinants of health and then the, the other category is the thing that i'm specifically working on which is health relevant data so um that closing that loop of all the things that we know that makes us healthy which is you know who we work with who we love where we eat what we buy all those things that um, our behaviours as well that we we know is what explains uh, whether we're going to be healthy or sick um, at the moment those data sets are all at very different degrees of maturity and we haven't worked out how those data sets fit together to kind of really explain why we have certain health outcomes or why certain health outcomes vary. Um, but they're all inching towards it, providing a little, little bit more information into creating that holistic idea of the fact that our health is made up of our healthcare, our genetics, our behaviors and our social determinants of health. Um, so yes, but as a, as a pinpoint solution at the moment, it's going to be a bit of a, an aha for people who maybe have certain cardiovascular conditions or who are insomniac or who just like measuring their steps. Um, but I think beyond that, they are going to be of limited clinical use in the immediate term, is my opinion. Thanks, Maxine. Dan, Mark, did, did you guys want to jump in on that? Yeah, sure. I, I think um, uh, I think Maxine's described that described that really well. And um, yeah, the, the the uses could be kind of relatively limited and more consumer facing. The the one area that um, is worth highlighting is uh, companies who are who are you trying to use. Um, uh, smartphones to enable more um, more home-based testing, and we're funding we're funding one of those through the award, um, which is a company called Healthy IO, who have a, a range of different solutions. But the ones that we're funding them um, funding them for is a uh, is a, a technology which is part of a solution of a home testing kit for um, acute kidney injury. So you receive a, a home testing kit that you can you know, either, um, have delivered to your house or pick up from a community pharmacy. You take the test at home and then the, um, the, the output of the test is a, is a, is a colour chart. 
So similar to the sort of uh, pregnancy test style, um, style output. And by taking a picture of it with your smartphone, um, that picture gets uploaded to the uh, to the cloud, and the AI processes the um, processes the image and provides a recommendation and diagnosis about whether or not the patient has this particular um, uh, particular issue or not. And there's going to be there's going to be more technologies who are looking to use the smartphone in a similar way to that, not just in um, um, not just in this case for for um, uh, kidney disease, but we'll also see technology companies using it for dermatological conditions, and I think there'll be more of that to come. So I think the 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 power of the smartphone is going to become apparent, um, but the role of wearables more generally will probably be um, more limited. Brilliant. Thanks, Dan. I think it's a great way to to, to wrap up. Um, Really insightful session. I've really enjoyed it. Um, I think we've been incredibly lucky to have three brilliant uh, panelists um, all contributing some really interesting insights here. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed the healthcare workshop and um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the AI festival. Thank you. <laughs>